Oh, <laughs> I've never done the record before, so this is new. You no, know, it is. It says up in the corner, it's now recording. <laughs> okay, that should be okay. Okay, yeah. So, um, thank you so much for joining me in this amazing topic. Hopefully, it's gonna be really, really good and helpful. Yeah, thank you. Wanna, you. Yeah, start off, introduce yourself, who you are, what you do. Okay, my name is Mikey, and I am a survivor of medical abuse and sexual assault. And I realized a few years ago while I was living in the UK that there's actually a huge issue surrounding the issue of cervical screening and people like me with trauma. And I started to see a lot of, you know, very not very kind conversations online, and I decided I wanted to change that. So me and a friend of mine started a little organization that's just the two of us called The Wrong Side of the Speculum, which we talk about issues surrounding screening and doctor's appointments, specifically with medical abuse and sexual violence survivors. And so we're trying to, you know, make changes to how this issue is viewed and really educate medical professionals, especially on how they can do better. So that is kind of our story and why I'm here today. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, and definitely, I think you're doing an amazing work um, from your Twitter and things like that. I love that you're tackling these things it's definitely it's something i do as well like anything i see if there's a gap in the nhs or whatever i try and tackle it and try and create change um and this is definitely why i wanted to talk to you and because it's obviously yeah. something that we're missing and i, I don't yeah. want any of my patients feeling like that if that was me um I, d I definitely wouldn't want to feel like that if I was the patient, if I was, if I was on the other end of the speculum, like your <laughs> Twitter thing. <page. laughs> um, so yeah, so yeah, this is why we're having these conversations, basically. But yeah, thank you so much for um, helping us with this. And thank you for, you know, being so willing to listen and to have this conversation. Okay, so um, let me find my questions. Or do you want to start or should, do you want me to start? Um, I guess you can do one and then I'll do one and we'll do it like that. Okay. That sounds good. Um, oh, actually, I've got it on my phone, haven't I? Struggling here. <laughs> Yeah, I have my laptop set up right now on top of a bin full of my dog's food. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. So the first question that um, I thought would be a good one to ask you, if you're comfortable obviously answering these things, um, what are your personal experiences of having a cervical screening? I know you briefly talked about uh, having a bad experience, so it'd be really nice for you to talk about that if you feel comfortable. And Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I kind of like discovered this was an issue when I was about 18 years old living in America. Basically, I wanted to go get on birth control. And I was very rudely informed, I should say, by a doctor that I would have to have a cervical screening before he would let me get on birth control. Oh, and I God. informed him like, hey, I'm actually not comfortable with that at all. Can I just like have the birth control? Like, I don't see why this is an issue. And he ended up telling me no. And so I left. I went home. And I did not go back for a very long time because that experience, like, kind of traumatized me a little bit. Because he was very much trying to sort of coerce me into doing it. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I wasn't being respected. And that discouraged me from even going to the doctor for a very long time. And then finally, I started, like, researching the issue more. And realized that a lot of other women were actually having the same problem. Mm. And for a very long time, I thought I was kind of like alone and kind of like the odd one out and the weird one. Because I felt like this and I just didn't want to do it. And everybody kept telling me like, oh, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. It's fine. But it wasn't fine to me. Yeah. And nobody really understood why I felt like I was, you know, being coerced into doing this, basically. And then upon being in the UK... I realized that it's also a big issue there. And the same thing happened all over again where a doctor told me, you know, you have to do this and just tried to coerce me into doing it. 
Yeah. And all these doctors were male doctors. So that, of course, made it more uncomfortable for me. I decided to find a female thinking that would change things, and it really didn't. They just kept trying to coerce me again and again and again. And eventually I sort of gave in and attempted, and I couldn't do it. Mm-hmm. And I had a very intense PTSD reaction. It was a very bad situation for me. I was having very negative thoughts, very just horrible mental health for a long time after that point, And I felt like I was sort of weird and broken. Mm-hmm. And it, it was very depressing for me. And I felt like I was never going to be like a normal person. Mm. And it took me a very long time to realize that other people with my trauma and in my situation feel very similar. And we're just kind of being sort of swept underneath the rug and ignored. And even since then, even now at 26, I have still not had a good experience with, you know, screening and doctors trying to get me to do it. Because really all I wanted was to just have my consent respected. I was completely willing to talk about it with them. And I might have even gone through with it if it hadn't been for the fact that they just refused to respect me. Mm. So I kind of never had a good experience with it. And that's what inspired me to want to change that for other people. So other young girls that were in my situation wouldn't have to feel what I was feeling. And kind of give them a safe space to come talk about it. Because most spaces online are unfortunately not safe spaces to discuss that. Yeah. And I think it's a really important thing to discuss because I don't know if you've seen the recent research that came out, but 97% of women in the UK are survivors of sexual violence or gender-based violence. So I think it's very important that, I mean, 97% is the vast majority. So it's important that we hear those people and that we understand their experiences. Yeah, definitely. Oh, thank you for that. It's, it's yeah. really, I don't even know what the logic would be of them trying to get you to um, have a smear before giving you birth control. That's just... To be just <laughs> bluntly honest with you, in the in the US, I think it has a lot to do with being able to charge extra. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think that's like a big inspiration oh, for that, is gosh. making a little bit of extra cash. Yeah. Oh. I think that's the problem. That's... That's yeah. That's just blown my mind. That actually, I can't and, believe that someone. And I, that. I think there's like a misconception in the United States because a lot of women have it yearly. Yeah. And I think there's like a misconception that like, oh my god, you're gonna die if you don't have this yearly. Yeah. And people kind of freak out about it and get very pushy, essentially. Oh, that's not good. Yeah, because in the UK we do it. Um, we three yearly. Yes. Um, and then five yearly when you go to 50, and then it stops when you're 64. That was quite like a culture shock to me. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, what do you mean it's not every year? What do you mean like public exams kind of aren't a thing? Yeah. And in other countries, in every other country as well, I think it is yearly because we've had people from um, like Poland and yeah. um, I had a girl the other day actually from the Philippines and she had hers yearly as well. Um Yes. But we know we've always been three yearly because apparently the research says that um, it's not needed yearly. So, yeah, I don't know why that is. <laughs> and that um, and that yearly can cause like more harm than good. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. I don't get it either. I think it has something to do with money. Possibly. Yeah. <laughs> it does make a lot of sense now that you're saying that about money. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, so. So with your, um, so those experiences that you've had now, has that just completely put you off now, um, ever having your cervical screening? Mm, A little bit, but I also kind of like made the decision that it might not be quite as necessary for me as it is for other people, because I'm not like really a very sexual person. Yeah. And like just the research I've done shows that it would probably be more detrimental to me than it would be beneficial, especially mental health yeah. wise. And I yeah. think it's like your mental health is just as important as your physical health. Definitely. Especially yeah. if you have a history of trauma or depression or having, you know, negative thoughts about your life and yourself. I think that's just as important. Yeah, definitely. And I think I'm, I am at a greater risk to suffer more trauma and more, you know, depression and bad thoughts if yeah. I did do that versus if I just took the risk by not. Doing. Yeah. And ultimately it is like a, it is kind of a rare disease. It's not like super common, not like diabetes or heart disease or something like that, that affects so many people. 
So that was kind of my logic in making the decision that I think I'm good. Yeah. I don't think I want to do it. <laughs> and you're absolutely allowed that choice as well. Yeah. Yes. And and like you've done the research and everything. You're so clued up on everything. Um, yeah. I, I mean, if I was your yes, I'd be like, yeah, okay, just sign her off. It's fine. <laughs> yes. I wish more nurses were like, yeah, she knows what she's talking about. Just like, <laughs> just let her go. Yeah. <laughs> And that's the thing, I think in healthcare, um, I'm going off a little bit off topic, kind of, um, I think in healthcare with nurses and doctors, um, we sort of, I don't, oh gosh, what's the word, um, like disempower patients sometimes, instead yes, of empowering them, and I, I almost, like, almost like a lot of them feel kind of like, well, I went to school for this, so I know better, yeah like I know better than this person who lives in this body because I went to school for it even though I have never lived their experience I think that's like an issue that's it yeah and um it's like um a doctor was saying to me the other day I don't know if I'm allowed to say this I'm gonna say anyway Uh, a doctor was saying to me um oh this patient that we've got at our clinic um they want to do their own injections at home instead of coming in and having their injections I said well why can't they have their own if they if that's their choice why can't they do their own injections at home and I said as long as we're bringing them in making sure they're safe give them the sharps boxes to put the injections in there's no reason I said we should be empowering our patients to do things like that and then it's going to save appointment times and I think we worry so much about, oh, God, what, what's the patient going to do? Like, they're not stupid. Patients aren't silly. No, no, no. They're quite well informed. Yeah. That actually quite leads well into a question that I wanted to ask you. Oh, yeah. What do you know about self-sampling for cervical screening? Oh, yeah. So this is quite new um, in the UK. I don't know if it's um, out anywhere else yet. And, um, you can pay for it in the US. What? <laughs> yeah, you can go on the internet. There's an app called Nurx, Nurix, something like that. I think it's in the UK as well, but you can just like order your own self-sampling thing and get it sent to you and you can test for HPV at home. Oh, okay, I need to look this up. But I, yeah. um, when I was looking at this, the new study that's being done at the minute, I think it's just in London at the minute. Um, yes. And from what I can gather from just reading that, it's going to be just like a swab, like if you were doing an STI sort of test, it'd just be a swab. Yeah you do yeah, yourself that's what it is. and send it off yeah and then it tests for the human papilloma virus um yes. but then if it was positive then they would send you to have a full screening i think by yeah. the sounds of it yes. yeah i think that's the idea behind yeah. it yeah but it sounds good i think it sounds amazing it, it helps so much i think definitely i think it would be extremely beneficial yeah if they can you know implement it on a full scale some countries actually use that as like their main screening method Wow. I I believe the Dutch do yeah. it. Yeah. And maybe Sweden, I think, might do it as well, that they just have, like, their main cervical screening program is yeah. just, you know, doing the self-sampling. Yeah. And then if there's a problem, then they go and investigate it. And yeah. I think that's how it should be done everywhere. That's it. It just sounds amazing. And it, like you said, it'd be so beneficial, and it's going to empower patients, like we were just talking about, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that would increase the uptake a lot more yeah. too, which that's like what all these organizations say they want to do, like Eva Peel, all those, they say, oh, we want to yeah. increase the uptake. But then why aren't you talking about the actual reasons that's it. the uptake is so low? Yeah, that's it. It really just like boggles my mind. Yeah. That they research on you. Sorry. Um, there's so many like research papers and stuff like that on barriers of uptake of cervical screening, but why isn't anyone doing anything about it? (laughs) Yeah. And not only that, what actually like made me and my friend start our organization was a survey Joe Cervical Cancer Trust did in 2018 that they, in my opinion, botched. They were supposedly conducting research on what the barriers were. But I took the survey myself. I still have screenshots of me Mm -hmm. taking the survey. And they didn't really ask about barriers like trauma or being a survivor, like at all. It was almost like the questions were sort of rigged to either lead people to believe people not going were just uneducated about it. Or that they were just like too embarrassed about it to do it. Yeah, that's interesting. it, It was kind of upsetting to see as somebody who does like face real barriers that are not just like oh I'm a little embarrassed or oh I don't understand it 
there was just like no I just had to like put other on all the questions because yeah. none of them fit me they were never about like yeah. my experience or the experiences of many other people it was just like yeah. oh you're embarrassed or you're just not educated that's yeah they need to yeah they need to look into that I think because <laughs> that's not good yeah I think yeah. they do and I mean, Joe's has been doing a lot better lately, mm. but in the past they've been sort of problematic. And I think it is them doing better is due to people like us kind of calling them out saying, Hey, that's not right. You guys need to do better. You need yeah. to improve this. Yeah. And sometimes that's what it takes as well. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. They didn't realize they were doing it wrong or they weren't including people or I don't know it's whatever they were possible. doing. <laughs> And sometimes it is possible because I think they kind of did the same thing with the gay and lesbian community. Okay. They were kind of like not including that group of people in any other research, which was kind of at a detriment to that community. And then once okay. they realized, hey, maybe we should include these people and they started including them, more research came out. Yeah, that's true. Um, I don't know if you know Seb. He did a, um, he's transgender, he's trans yeah. Uh, transgender, yeah, and he did a piece yeah. for, yeah, Joe's Trust. Um, he did an amazing piece. And I think it was when I saw that piece, I was like, oh gosh, this has really opened my eyes now to a lot of things, yeah. actually. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, more needs to be done on all of it. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, what else? So my next question is just talking more about language. Um, so like when people are trying to get you to do your smear or whatever experience you've had, like what sort of language do you think is really unhelpful or offensive? I would say never use the word relax. Mm. Just like as a rule of thumb, don't use that word. That is a very, very common trigger word and a word that a lot of us heard during abuse or an assault. Yeah. So our brain is going to automatically connect that word to like, hey, I am in an unsafe situation. I am in danger. Yeah. It's completely unhelpful. Just telling somebody to relax is not really going to make them relax anyway. So it's like just avoid the word relax. Avoid like talking about spreading your legs, things like that. Instead, like let your legs fall open like lower your hips, things like that, that kind of basically make it sound like a medical procedure and not a sexual experience. Yeah. Because I think a lot of medical professionals make the mistake of using words that they might think are being very helpful, but in actuality is very detrimental to the patient yeah. and is probably making the experience way more traumatic than it needs to be for them. Yeah. There is actually a account called The Feminist Midwife. It's run by mm -hmm. a midwife, and uh, I think she's a nurse as well. And she has a whole thing, I believe, on her website and on her Twitter that is about inclusive language and using helpful language versus things you just shouldn't say. Yeah. So I recommend any medical professional watching this go learn from her. Because she's really, you know, got it down to a science of being as helpful as possible and minimizing being triggering. Oh, that's good. Yeah, definitely. I've heard of her on Twitter. I think I'm following her now. I think you must have mentioned it and I followed her maybe when Probably. you mentioned it. Yeah. <laughs> Probably, because I yeah. really do love her content and she's yeah. been very helpful. Like in these conversations, I believe she's in the U.S., but she has contributed a lot to teaching people about how their language affects people because I mean language affects a lot it's like yeah. our main method of communication with each other and if you can't communicate with your patients and in a helpful beneficial way you might not be in the right profession yeah if you can't sort of learn what is helpful and what is unhelpful and triggering maybe don't work directly with patients if you want to work in healthcare. yeah as I mean, as, as nurses, you guys have the power to either make it a good experience or make it an absolutely horrible experience that will put somebody off going to the doctor for years like it did with me. Yeah, yeah that's it. Definitely. Um, it's funny, actually, when you were saying about um, one of the trigger words being relax as well. I think we, we briefly spoke about it on Twitter. And then a few days later, I was doing a cervical smear with this lady and when I'd finished, I was putting the things away and she said, oh, and thank you for, for not telling me to relax. And I, was, I just I remembered your comment. And I was like, 
oh, I wonder if she's been through something and that's why she said that. But I would never have thought of that if I hadn't had that conversation with you. So that was really interesting. Yeah, Yeah. it just, yeah. it's, it's. I think a lot of the times it's not that medical professionals like want to be, you know, bad to people. It's just that they don't get it. Yeah. They've never experienced it. And I think a lot of the times they get sort of defensive, like we were talking about before, when you tell them, hey, that's actually really unhelpful and could yeah. be very damaging to some people. And this is how you can do it better. Yeah. They just think like, oh, well, you're not a medical professional. You don't have this experience. So you don't matter. Mm. Your opinion doesn't matter. It's not the way to, <laughs> not the way forward no, no, no. <laughs> in health. Yeah, you should. I think everything should be taken as a learning experience. Yeah. And if you do do something you know, wrong. If you make someone uncomfortable, you should just say, Hey, I'm really sorry. I did not realize that I can use this to do better in the future. Definitely. Yeah. Well, like my, um, YouTube video. So yeah, I'll just quickly explain. I haven't explained that at the start. Um, but I did a YouTube video for those of you who don't know, um, on cervical screening. And there were some things I said in there that I just didn't realize. And it just went, and it wasn't until you pointed it out. You said, actually, this is really unhelpful. And I was like, what? And then I watched it back and I was like, Oh my God. And I was actually mortified at the things that I was saying and I just didn't click and I didn't realize. And I was like, yeah, you just, you didn't realize. Delete it. And then I completely deleted it. And like, I need to do this again. I was actually like deeply impressed with you that you did that. <laughs> like I was, I was like bracing myself because I had no idea who you were or anything at that point. So I was like, oh God, oh God, she's going to freak out. She's going to freak out on me. <laughs> no, I'm coming for you. <laughs> like that's the experiences I've had with uh, people. Oh, that like when I told me hey, that's actually pretty helpful. Here's what you can say that would be better. They're just like, no, you're bad, you're bad human. Go away. And it's like, stop it. Just educate yourself a little, dude. That's it. We're not going to learn unless we recognize our, our our own issues and the things that we do yes. wrong and get wrong. So, I mean, yeah. everybody makes mistakes. Everybody yeah. has flaws and things that they're not so good at and things that they're really good at. And you just got to learn from those mistakes. Yeah, definitely. Everybody's going to make them. And, you know, sometimes that mistake could be really detrimental or it could be just a little one. Yeah. But what, like, really matters is how you go on and learn from that and how you do better for somebody else in the future. Yeah, definitely. And that's hopefully the message we're going to get across today. Um, okay. We might have covered the last one. What advice can you give to healthcare professionals to help others? <laughs> There's several things. I would say that if they seem uncomfortable with like having the conversation about screening, just stop having it. Like try to sort of bring it up to them, engage their reaction, kind of read the room and see how they're reacting. And if they seem like really uncomfortable or like it's making them kind of triggered, I would say just table the discussion for later. And if they, you know, are open to talking about it and they say, I'm actually not comfortable doing that right now, just, you know, explain to them what the screening is, what it entitles, do your whole little spiel that you always do. Mm -hmm. And then just ask them, are you comfortable with it now? And if they say no, just respect it. Yeah. Don't kind of try to push them to do it. Because that will, again, make them feel kind of coerced and kind of like they're being put in a similar situation to maybe a use they experienced. And they're not going to, you know, trust you if you do that. And, of course, watch your language. Be careful about what you're saying and how you're saying it. Avoid trigger words, which you can probably find a list not only on the feminist midwife, but there's probably other places, too, that you can find, like, a list of the common trigger words so you know what they are and you can avoid them. But I think it really comes down to just respect and informed consent. Yeah. You just have to do what you can and then respect their decision and kind of acknowledge that if they decide they don't want to screen, that is their decision too. And like, it should just be respected. They shouldn't be pressured. Yeah. And of course, learn from your mistakes. Everybody's going to make them just learn. 100% and apologize when you do make a mistake (laughs) because I think a lot of especially doctors and nurses kind of make the mistake getting too defensive Mm. almost like they're blaming the person for it versus just you know saying hey I'm sorry I didn't realize that yeah 
Yeah. There's a lot, yeah, of, a lot on Twitter as well. You yeah. Probably how many people are open to actually talking about their issue with it and what they go through, but we're just not given the opportunity. Thank you. <laughs> that is all my questions. <laughs> all right. I'll ask you some of mine. I have to get down here and get my laptop back. <laughs> What are NHS nurses taught about informed consent in your experience? Um, so for us, it's, well, what I've been taught and what I know, um, we have to give the patient all of the information about something so that they can make the choice whether to go for it or not. Um, and yeah. that, that involves like the risks as well as the benefits. Um, yeah. Yeah. Is there any kind of like trauma-informed care crash course with the NHS or are you guys just like expected to teach that to yourselves? Um, do you know what? This is the first I've heard of anything like this. Um, I personally haven't had any training on that sort of topic at all. Um, the only sort of brief sort of thing that I've I found was when I was in sexual health and you're sat there, you're faced with it because they're, they're disclosing it to you and you're like, oh gosh, okay. How do I handle this situation? Like no one tells you these sort of things, but it definitely, definitely, if it's not out there already in the UK, it needs to be, I think. Yes, I think that is a big part of like the issue with how survivors have to deal with the stuff with cervical screening. I think nurses and doctors just are not being taught this. And unfortunately, if we can't make a change to the actual NHS, then I think they're just going to take the initiative to learn it themselves, mm. you know, benefit their patients. They're just yeah. going to have to say, hey, I'm not being taught this. I need to learn it. I'm going to go do research. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And I think actually listening not only to other medical professionals, but to actual people who have lived the experience would be helpful. Yeah, definitely. Because I've, I've seen a lot of nurses that I've, like, mentioned something to them say, like, oh, well, I'm a survivor as well. So, like, I think I understand this, but yeah. even if you are a survivor, you're also still a nurse. Yeah. So, for you, like, you do cervical screening seven times a week. It's not a thing, like, a big thing for you. It's just, yeah. like, oh, it must be Tuesday. Yeah. For us, it's like a huge deal that we have panic attacks about and we think about for weeks and we just have all these horrible feelings about it. So even if, like, you can be a survivor, but you're still a survivor who is a nurse. Yeah. So your perspective is informed by being a nurse and not just by being a survivor. Yeah. So I think it's really taking initiative to learn if the NHS is not going to teach you. Yeah. I guess this question is kind of already answered, but I'll go ahead and ask it. Do patients have the right to request a nurse who is trained in trauma-informed care? Well, if they can find one, yes. <laughs> yes. That's kind of the thing. It's like, but, um, do they exist? Do they not? It's like the, it's like aliens. Like some people think they exist and others don't. I know. It'd be interesting to find out actually if what nurses are trained, like if this is a thing out there that I just don't know about. Um, I have heard about one clinic that I believe there's one in London and uh, Manchester. I'm not sure okay. though. It's called the My Body Back Project. Oh yes, I was thinking about this earlier. It's supposed to be like very much based around trauma informed care for survivors, but I have also spoken to a couple people who had kind of negative experiences. Okay. So I'm like a bit reluctant to recommend that because of that. Mm. But I mean, there's tons of people who say they had a really good experience too. Yeah. So it might just like yeah. come down to personal preference. Yeah. I'm not really sure because I've never had the experience myself. Yeah. When I was looking at the website, I was looking at this earlier actually, as I was doing a little bit of research around different things. Um, and on the website, it said they use a lot of volunteers. So who's um, sort of training the volunteers and what sort of training do they get would be my question, I think. But it sounded really yeah. good when I first looked at it. I thought, oh, yeah, this sounds really good. I didn't even know this clinic existed. Um, yeah. But then who's training them? What sort of training are they getting? And yeah. 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 Who knows? Yeah. And, of course, every once in a while, just like a kind of crappy person is going to slip through the cracks and, you know, get in somewhere they shouldn't be. Mm. And that might be what happened with the experiences I was told about. Mm. I'm not quite sure. 
is how invasive and traumatic cervical screening can be for survivors something that nurses are typically aware of and something that you discuss among yourself or is it just kind of something that you're kind of clueless about you don't really understand it most of the time um for me um because i worked in sexual health and i've seen sort of um sexual assault survivors and things like that from that perspective i'm a little bit more aware about it um yeah. But I don't know about other people because it's not something, again, it's not really something that you talk about. It's not something that you get training on or anything like that. So I'm not sure, to be honest, <laughs> which is really bad. Yeah. Um, but I know from my point of view, I try and be respectful to all of my patients and um, sort of make sure that if they want a chaperone and things like that, they can do that. If they don't want the spear, then that's fine. And respecting yeah. that sort of decision, yeah. I think like the most important thing you can do is just assume that every single patient that walks through your door might be a survivor because yeah. they are for all you know, and they might yeah. not feel this com like comfortable disclosing that to you. Yeah. Well, like you were it saying, 97% of the stats say so. So we should really be doing it that way. Yeah. Maybe, I think. Yeah. Yes. Where did you first hear the term trauma-informed care and what did you think of it when you did hear it? Um, probably from you. That's <laughs> the first time I heard of it. Um, yeah, that, that sounds <laughs> like a little bit disappointing in the NHS. <laughs> Terrible, isn't it? Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, like that should be like one of the first things they teach you as a nurse. Yeah. And it's just kind of almost like people want screening to be viewed as like this positive happy like rainbows puppy dogs kind of subject yeah. and they don't want to admit like hey that's not how it is for a lot of people yeah you could sit there and say oh it's just five minutes and it's just a little uncomfortable all you want but if that doesn't reflect the majority of experiences then you're just kind of screaming into a void yeah it's like repeating yourself like a broken record again and again and again and not benefiting anyone which is unfortunate yeah if a patient tells you they don't want to participate in screening at all, what is your reaction? Um, I would be okay with it. Like we've said, um, everyone's got the choice. And as long as I'm giving that patient all of the options and they've got the obviously capacity and everything to make their choice, then that's up to them. Um, and I know on, I don't know if it's everywhere, but on our system that we use, there is an opt out button. So if someone wanted to just opt out of cycle screening for the rest of their lives, I could tick that button and then that would be it. Um, yeah, yeah I, I wouldn't have a problem with it because it is patient choice. I'm not going to force anyone. <laughs> no, definitely yeah, not. That is a good way to view it. I'm glad that <laughs> at least some nurses do view it that way. <laughs> for me, opting out was like a nightmare. Oh, it was really difficult. Nobody wanted to listen to me. I spent literally hours on the phone getting lectured. Just like again and again and again. One medical mm -hmm. professional actually called me dumb, like to my face. Yeah, that was a disappointing experience. Oh, God. It's, it's just shocking. Is, in, is ensuring that people understand informed consent and the risk and benefit something that is really important to you and what about other nurses in your experience yeah it's definitely important to me because it's something that I was always taught it's like you always have to give the patient all of the options um because if you're doing something and you haven't given all of the options and you haven't documented or anything that you haven't given them options you know I could be up against in court because it's sort of neglect or abuse I suppose in a way because you haven't given them all of the options to make that informed yeah. choice I have um, been in a courtroom for that. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, I was 17. Oh, wow. I went after the hospital that initially caused my trauma. Oh, gosh. But, yeah, but that's why. <laughs> this is why. We have yep. to give all the choices. I can't speak for everybody else, um, but I'm hoping that everyone out there would definitely give patients options. Obviously, it doesn't happen if you've been through that experience. People haven't yeah. given you the choice, and that's... Yep. It's not okay. No, like it's, it is not. It's not something that you just, you're not trained to do. It's just, it's, it, you do it. It's not, um, it's not like a common sense thing. It's something everyone should be doing as a standard. 
Yeah, it's uh, it's almost like whoever like came up with the training programs for the NHS and probably a lot of other like medical organizations. I think they just kind of think, well, that's common sense. Why would anyone not do that? And they don't realize yeah. that quite a few people completely lack common sense. <laughs> Some people just, like, need to be told everything, and they're not being, you know, told how to yeah. appropriately get informed consent and how to respect their patients and such. So, we need to stop treating it as a common sense thing and just treat it as everybody needs to be taught this. Yeah. How much do you know about the potential risk and benefits of screening, and what you do know about it, did you learn from the NHS, or did you learn on your own? Um, so all of my training was through like proper training. Um, so we had a three day course that we had to attend. Um, and then you'd obviously get the mannequin to practice just vocal sampling and things like that on. Um, and then I would have to supervise. So I was alongside my mentor for, um, five patients. I had to watch and see how they did it. Um, and then they would watch me doing my bit to make sure I was doing everything. Okay. Um, but yeah, so I sorry, I was a long way around to say it. I was taught through like proper training. Yes. Yeah. And like, what did they teach you about the actual risk? Um, I think probably more the benefits were spoken about than the yeah. risks. Um, yeah, I I do think that is kind of an issue. The benefits are over like dramatized and overstated, and the risks are kind of understated. Mm. Almost like the benefits are like put on a banner and then the risks are like a dirty little secret that nobody needs to know about <laughs> is kind of how I think it's treated a lot of the times. But yeah, you're right in a way because it was all about the benefits of cervical screening. It's going to save lives and it's going to do this. Um, and then the risks were just like a little, here's the risks. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, It's like the fine print. <laughs> Almost, it's like the fine print of a contract that, you know, you sign it without reading it, and then it's like, oh, crap, these risks are real. <laughs> yeah. And what did, what do you know about the risk of LEAP procedures? Oh, um, so as part of the training that I did, we had to do a visit to colposcopy. Um, yeah. And I went in, I sat with a consultant who was, he was really good, to be honest. He was very pro women's health. I was like, wow, this guy's amazing. Like he's all for women's health, supporting the women and the hormones. And he was really, really good, to be honest. Um, but yeah, he went through all the lalettes and how they do it. And I saw a procedure and things like that. Um, and they went through like the risks of severe bleeding, infections, um, potential can cause miscarriage as well. Um, oh, that was talked about? Yeah, this guy, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's really good that he was talking about it. Yeah. Because I've actually spoken quite a bit with somebody on Twitter who she had a leap procedure and, you know, had a miscarriage. And she oh. was not warned that that would be a risk beforehand. Oh, no. So it kind of, like, came as, like, she said that she would never have done it. Yeah. She would have known miscarriage was a risk. Yeah. She knew she was pregnant going in and she just wasn't told. Yeah. Fortunately, lost her baby because of that lack of information. Because oh. surely she could have waited until she gave birth and then had the treatment. Maybe I don't think if you would have. Yeah, yeah I'm, her, I'm not sure. That probably would have been fine, but she just yeah. wasn't informed. That was a risk. She was told yeah. it'd be fine. It goes back to informed consent, doesn't it? She wasn't yes. really informed. Yeah. Nope. She mm. was informed of the stuff that make her want to do it, and then not yeah. the stuff that would make her not want to do it, basically. Oh. And was like potential nerve damage and chronic pain ever like discussed with leap procedures, like the risk of it? Um, pain, yes. They talked about pain and they used the iodine and things like that to stop for infection, yeah. things like that afterwards. Um, nerve damage, I don't remember anything being mentioned about nerve damage, to be honest. Yeah, were you kind of led to believe that the cervix doesn't contain nerves? <laughs> didn't even think about it but it must contain something because there's some feel in there <laughs> yes yes that is the whole thing there's actually a lady on twitter her name is kate orson and she wrote a whole book about her experience with it no. and you know basically most people performing colposcopies and late procedures don't really acknowledge that there's nerves in the cervix okay. for some reason yeah oh there must be yeah because when i saw it happen they um 
used anesthesia on the cervix yes. and injected it. So there must be nerves, yeah. Yes, it's it's kind of like, why are you guys trying to say there's no nerves, but then yeah. using anesthesia, which lets you know that there has to be yeah, nerves there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it, it's kind of like they're just denying something very obvious. <laughs> That's true. And with anything, like if you were to get an implant, for example, contraception, they talk yeah. about nerve damage yeah. and bruising that can happen. So why wouldn't they do that with the cervix? That's, that's a really good point. Hmm. Yes, it, there's a lot of very, especially with the statistics and stuff, just stuff that doesn't necessarily add up. Like if you really start to think about it, it just yeah. ends up not making a whole lot of sense. Yeah. Maybe yeah especially. Oh, I don't know. I was going to say like maybe they're thinking about the benefits outweighs the risk, but then they should still be given informed consent and telling yes, them all of the yes, side exactly. effects and dangers. Yeah, exactly. Like I was told the whole time I lived in the UK that the cervical screening program saves five thousand lives per year. Mm. But if only about three thousand people are going to even get near cervical cancer, how how is that possible that it saves five thousand? It's a good question. It almost like it doesn't add up when you really start to think about it. It's like, yeah. what are what are they saying? What do you think we could do to encourage other nurses to be more open minded about being trauma informed? Oh, um, what can we do? I think just spreading the message. There definitely needs to be more training, a hundred percent, on these sort of things. Um, and I think just the use of social media as well to sort of target maybe the healthcare professionals to say, Oh, did you know about this? How are you more aware about this? Yes. Um, and I know definitely is cervical screening awareness week coming up. I'm thinking now what the, can, what can I tweet now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> sort of hopefully inform people and hopefully make some sort of change out there. Are nurses typically aware of how many times leap procedures are actually unnecessary? Yeah, I wasn't, um, I'm not sure about that one, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. Um, it's not something that's discussed, I don't think. I haven't seen it anywhere about unnecessary procedures or anything like that. Um, yeah. Whether they're thinking again, does, does the risk outweigh the benefit? Does the benefit outweigh the risk or I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I think a, the big part of this problem is that there's an automatic assumption that for every single person universally that the benefit is going to outweigh the risk. And I just don't think like the person's medical history, the person's like sexual history, the person's mental health is ever like really taken into consideration, like whether or not it would be detrimental or good for them. Yeah. So I think that is definitely something that needs to be taken into consideration more frequently. Yeah. I think that is a big thing. Yeah. And again, they should really, if they're going to do a proper job, <laughs> be getting all of the medical history and getting yes. informed consent before even starting something like that. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And possibly possibly find a way to let the patient know that if they are a survivor, if they do have a history of trauma, they can come forward with that and maybe have a way to do that where they feel safe like maybe put it on their paperwork or something so they don't have to like physically say the words yeah. this happened to me yeah I think that would be really helpful because I know I was not you know comfortable disclosing my history yeah. with those traumas to anybody yeah especially not a complete stranger that I just met yeah. which is understandable. that's another like important thing to realize is that like the person you're performing a smear on doesn't know you from Adam so, like, for all they know, even if you're the nicest, kindest person in the world, for all I, they know, you might not be. Yeah. And you might be very judgmental. You might be very unaccepting. So they might not feel comfortable coming forward about mm -hmm. things. It's almost like a thing I saw a while ago of a nurse wearing, like, an LGBTQ flag. And then people felt comfortable, you know, coming out to her. Yeah. And letting her know these things because she had that flag on her telling them, hey, I'm accepting of this. It's almost like we need something like that yeah. for trauma survivors, too, so they will know, like, hey, this is a safe person. This is a yeah. safe space. Yeah. Because sadly, a lot of surgeries and clinics just are not a safe place for survivors at all. Yeah. So. Oh. And... 
have you ever, do you like follow anybody like Eva Peel or Joe's Trust or anything like the work they do? Yeah, I follow um, Joe's Trust. Yes. And the feminist midwife <laughs> I now follow. Yeah. Have I don't you ever kind of them. like, kind of like noticed some of the problematic posts they make and, you know, thought, hey, that's not really helpful? Like, has it ever, like, clocked? Have you ever, like, clocked it on any of those accounts? Like, hey, that might not be helpful. <laughs> um, I think I'm starting to recognise a lot more now, now that I'm looking into things and, like, talking to Seb as well about his experiences yeah. and talking to you. Um, you do start to notice more. But before speaking to anybody about this and not really thinking about it, it's just like another post and you, you're not really sort of registering what the words are. And yes, I think that is an issue that like for me, because of my personal experiences, I automatically clock it. Yeah. Like when someone's not being trauma informed enough and they're not being sensitive enough, I'm like, oh, hey, hey, bad. That's bad. Yeah. yeah. But I don't think most people do that. And I think that's something that could be improved upon a lot especially with Eva Peel in particular. <laughs> like, we've had some we've had some run-ins with them in the past. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and they, um, for, I believe it was, I believe it was in January. It might have been Cervical Cancer Awareness Month. Yeah. They made a post that was kind of like a sexualized graphic. Oh. It was, like, very sexual- and let me see if I can actually find what the graphic said so I can yeah, read it to you. Because no, I'm not following them on Twitter. Understand, like, the context. Okay, the graphic is kind of an illustration of, like, a woman's outline with her legs spread and, like, the vagina is a heart. Okay. And the, <laughs> the um... The thing, like, the caption on it is, have no fear, get your smear. And a lot of, especially with the caption they put with it, a lot of survivors were, like, a little bit thinking that wasn't okay. Yeah. And a lot of people were sort of triggered yeah. by just, like, the post in general. Yeah. And I reached out to them personally on my personal Twitter account. We reached out to them on the Around Side the Speculum account. My friend reached out to them on her personal account and several other patient advocates reached out as well and said, hey, this is like kind of upsetting. Mm. Like this is a little bit triggering for survivors to see. And we would honestly recommend that you delete this and apologize for it. Because obviously multiple people are upset. Yeah. And their response was to basically say that they told me I was the only one that complained. They told my friend she was the only one that complained. <laughs> And th even though, like, you can look on, yeah. before they deleted it, you could look on the post, and the whole thing was just, like, people saying, hey, that's <laughs> a little weird, that's a little too sexual, maybe yeah. don't do that, yeah. and they're just, like, denying it, like, going, no, 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 you're the only person blaming me. It's fine with everybody else, you're just weird. And so, when they kind of refused to delete it, we started a petition mm. to kind of try to make them... You know, see, like, hey, we're not the only one with a problem with this. This is kind yeah. of a triggering issue. And we got several hundred signatures on the petition. Yeah. And their response was to essentially tell us that by using the graphic on the petition, we were violating their copyright. <laughs> oh, my God. The CEO of the Eve Appeal threatened to personally sue me. <laughs> oh, my God. And it was just like, oh, jeez. Oh, God. But then, if they posted that publicly on Twitter, it's no longer their property. Not only was it <laughs> no longer their property because they posted it publicly on Twitter, it was not their property to begin with. It was a graphic that was used in the Vagina Museum. I don't know if you've heard of that. It was a graphic that a volunteer made for the Vagina Museum. Oh, okay. And they just, like, got permission to use it and tried to say they were going to, you know, sue us. Mm -hmm reposting their graphic and it was just nonsense yeah and it really opened my eyes to how much people just don't understand this issue yeah and how much organizations just like they care more about right than they do about spreading consent and you know being drivers 
Eva Peel is especially bad at it. They've posted a lot of things that, like, I cringe reading their Twitter sometimes because, like, oh my god, stop. And time and time again, we've reached out to them and nothing changes. With Joe's Trust, we've reached out a lot and things have improved. Mm. That's good. They gradually started to kind of improve and they stopped posting before, like, 90% of Joe's Trust posts were about how it's all about embarrassment. Mm. And, like, embarrassment is the biggest barrier. Yeah. And that started to change after we started reaching out to them and telling them, hey, this is actually a pretty important thing that you guys should be talking about. And, again, with Seb, I think that Mm. was important that they did that post with him. And also, she does work with Eva Peel, so I would prefer she didn't do that. But your cervix, she is a survivor and an advocate who is specifically offering peer support for survivors. Oh, that's nice. So she's doing a lot of really good work with that, and I think that she has changed a lot of people's minds about a lot of stuff. So I would recommend anybody interested in this to go follow her. I believe she might be on hiatus right now because she had some cancer issues. Oh, she actually yeah. had cancer herself. So. But she does a lot of really great work, the feminist midwife. I would say just avoid Eve appeal. <laughs> I'm not following them, so it's okay. <laughs> yes, I would not, you know, recommend them. <laughs> They're another one of those organizations that I think kind of want to be right and make themselves look good. And they don't particularly um, care that they might be doing damage as well. It's a shame. Yes. And another person that I would say to avoid would be the smear campaign. That is like a, it is a very new initiative run by a guy who sadly lost his wife to cervical cancer. Mm. And he is, how do I say this nicely? (laughs) Extremely close-minded. Okay. He does not want to talk about trauma or anything. Uh So there's, an abundance of organizations that don't want to talk about this. Yeah. And not enough that are like open yeah. to talk about it, which is why it meant a lot to me when I reached out to you and you were so open to hearing it. Yeah. It's, it just baffles me that people are so closed about it when we should be making these conversations and talking about it. Um, we should, I mean, if it was something like, Oh, I don't know, a learning disability. <laughs> like, we'd be yeah. talking about it. We'd be helping people. If someone got offended, it'd be discrimination. So, yes. Why wouldn't it be with, help with you know, people? racial issues? It's the same thing. Yeah. Like, if, like, I think something like 85% of sexual violence survivors don't want to attend. If it was like 85% of black people, then if you didn't want to talk about that, you would be being discriminatory. But for some reason, when it's an issue like sexual violence or trauma, it's no longer discrimination to sweep us underneath the rug, and I really don't think that's fair. Mm. This is just as important of a conversation as LGBTQ stuff and racial justice stuff. Definitely. Really, it confuses me a lot why so many people are so close-minded about it yeah it's very (laughs) (laughs) but you are doing one of or you are one of the good ones and doing good work I'm gonna try (laughs) I mean just by you know being open to having this conversation you're already doing so much better than so many others yeah that's good yeah and hopefully we can create some uh, Twitter posts and things like that and yes. raise more awareness, hopefully, as well with it. Um, yes. And I'm in a group as well with some GP nurses from across the UK as well, like in a WhatsApp group. Yes. And I've told them that I'm doing this with you today and they're really excited about it and they want to see the video and learn well, from it. So that was, <laughs> they're a nice bunch, to be fair. They're, they're quite good and they're open to change and things like that. So they're, they're a good, they're good think- bunch of nurses. A lot of, like, nurses, especially newer ones just coming into the course, are willing to listen. Mm. I think a lot of the ones that have, you know, been doing this for 30, 20, 40 years are a little bit jaded. At this point, they're just kind of like, I've done it this way for my entire career and I don't want to change now. Yeah, that's true. 
they're that was just like, like they're their mm. yes yeah i have seen nurses like that as well that are just in autopilot mode they've been doing it for years and they won't accept any change <laughs> doesn't matter how yes, positive they're, towards them <laughs> they're just like no this is me this is how it is <laughs> you don't like it go away yeah yeah this closed-mindedness essentially it's true but there are a lot of people that do want to see change and a lot yeah. of people that are open to it and a lot of people talking about it online now. Yeah, which is good. We should be having these yeah. uh, conversations. Yes, that is one of the best things about the internet is that we can kind of like almost force people to have these conversations. <laughs> yeah, you will see like, this if, post. <laughs> yes, if it's just like a group of friends at lunch talking about it, that's not really going to, you know, provide systemic change. Mm -hmm. That's just some friends talking. But if you can put it on the internet and like make nurses see it and make doctors see it and make these organizations like Joe's Trust and Eva Peel see it, then that can make real change. Yeah. Because even just like one person, now maybe the next person that walks into your exam room, mm. you're going to think she might be a survivor. I should just automatically do this. Yeah versus before you might have thought just another cervical screening it's fine <laughs> yeah i'm in autopilot mode <laughs> yes because like i said for you it's a day that ends in y for us it's like a big deal yeah no i'm so thankful that you're willing to have these talks oh you. i'm so thankful for you for reaching out and um making your comment and then yeah getting in touch it's just yes. it's really important to me that i tackled that because I don't want anyone to ever feel like like that because that's not nice and no one should yeah. ever feel like that. So hopefully. And, and I mean, I know you never intended to hurt or offend anyone. Yeah. Most people don't. Yeah. And they just don't realize like maybe the language they're using yeah. is triggering or offensive for some people. Maybe they're not being as accepting as they could be. Because again, it's just like autopilot mode. Yeah. Like, this is just, like, an everyday part of your job. It's just the same way I might view doing my dishes or cleaning up after my dog. It's just, like, a part of life that I have to do. Yeah. And I don't think some medical professionals realize that for other people it's actually a very big yeah. deal. Yeah, definitely. And how much, you know, power they have over the experience we have as patients. Yeah. And hopefully we can create better experiences, hopefully. Hopefully that would be the goal, yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, you know, create some change with the actual training process of mm. nurses. Because oh, yeah. that would probably go a long way if it's like, it is like required for you to have this conversation. Yeah. Like you're not getting out of it. This is part of your classwork, basically. You have to have this talk. Yeah. So. That would be good. But yeah. every, every movement, every little bit of systemic change that's ever happened in the world just started with one or two people. It's true. It's the ripple effect. <laughs> yep. I do believe that we can make changes <laughs> if we just try. Definitely. And if we get more open-minded people, like you were when I commented. So, this was a really important conversation, and thank you so much for being open to it. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. It's been yes. lovely. It's been really nice, actually. It's been a really nice conversation, yeah. some really good, important things as well. So, yeah, it's good. <laughs>